Uh, take your Bible, turn to 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. And then Judges chapter 2. 2 Corinthians 12, Judges chapter 2. It's good to have everybody here. Good to have everybody visiting with us online. I say visiting, you're not visiting if you're regulars. So we appreciate you. Thank God for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Paul realizes that the things that have befallen him have fallen on him for a reason. Um, I was thinking about this lesson this morning and uh, with just a little bit of a troubled, troubled heart. Uh, when you realize that the thorns that you have tend to not go away. Some of them, yes, God takes some of them out. And probably a majority, um, ah, I just got a notification. Yes, Michael did get his luggage. So praise the Lord. So those of you who just prayed, God answered your prayer two days ago. So that's great. <laughs> anyway, hey, I just believe God can do that. Uh, but anyway, um, you pray for things to be better. You pray for your life to be better. You pray for um, circumstances to be better. And in most cases, they are. In most cases, they are. But there's always going to be one or two things that God is always going to... They're there to help us. They are there to help us. Uh, I'll say it that way, and then we'll get into the Scriptures. So he says in verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. It's five things here. Five always deals with grace. Um, my opinion, it deals with, it sort of looks toward the rapture. Uh, and I believe that infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, and distresses all take place and are going to take place. And we do these things for the sake of Christ. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. Now, I want you to go back to Judges. If you would, turn your Bible there. Uh, we mentioned last Sunday morning that uh, the first place you find thorns showing up in your Bible is in the book of Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3... We find that the, the curse of sin, uh, the curse of Adam's sin primarily had to do with, um, what did I tell you, judges? Then why did I turn to Joshua? But anyway, for Adam's sin, for Adam's transgression, God said he was going to curse the ground with thorns. He would sow his seed and he would eat of that seed but it would be by the sweat of his face, number one. And number two, it would be, see, it's wintertime. But anyway, be by the sweat of his face and it would be, there would be thorns coming up from the ground. So that's part of the issue of sin. Judges chapter two, uh, verse one. God said, an angel of the Lord came, upon, came up from Gilgal to Bochum and said, I made you go out of Egypt and have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides and their gods 
shall be a snare unto you. So now I want you to look at Judges chapter 3, next chapter over. And let's back up just a couple verses to verse 21 of the previous chapter. He said, I will also not henceforth drive out any from before them uh, of the nations which Joshua left when he died, that through them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Therefore, underline this in your Bible, the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. Now we pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 3. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. Verse 2 is, is what our focus is today. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing thereof, namely five lords of the Philistines and all the Canaanites and the Sidonians and the Hivites that dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal Hermon unto the entering in of Hamath, they were there to prove Israel by them to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord, which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Uh, it doesn't take much. When I look around, you know, you try not to judge people. You try not to, um, you know, look upon an individual and say, well, there's, they're this type or they're that type. But it is obvious in the in this country, I can speak for America, it is obvious in this country that we have a generation of young people, and I would put that in the teenage years, into the early 20s, and maybe into the early 30s. And this does not touch all of them, but for the most part, if a war were to break out in this country, would we make it if we were dependent on the generation from, let's say, 16 years old right now up until the age of 30? If we were to depend on them, I mean, naturally, older guys would fight for their country. OK, but I know the older I get the more comfortable I want to be throughout the day rather than getting out, hitting it every day. Make sense? In other words, I can't climb up walls and jump down off of them and climb ropes and climb trees like I used to. And just going from one step down to the next, I'm worried about falling and breaking my hip. Right? So, I mean, war... To fight a battle requires young, limber bodies that fall down and they get back up. I fall down and I need four people to help me up. You get what I'm saying? You look around, you go to Walmart, you go to the stores, you look around, you look at young people, especially young men, and ask yourself, what if we had an army full of guys like that? Where would we stand? How would we be? Am I the only one who thinks that way? Okay, so you get what I'm saying. We have gotten, uh, there was a judge, Cubby, you'll like this. There was a judge that made a ruling that said no police officer testifying in his courtroom could wear their sidearm in the courtroom. He's shaking his head, okay? I'm going to give a visual explanation of what Cubby's doing back there. He's shaking his head going, why is that a bad idea, Cub? He is an officer of the court. Every police officer is an officer of the court 
that stands ready to defend the courthouse, the sanctity of that courthouse. This one judge, and there was like, they said there was like 20 judges in this courthouse, and only one judge refused. And so the, the cops and the police union said, forget it, we're not testifying. In this guy's courtroom, told the prosecutor, shuffle our cases to some other judge, and of course that judge turned it down, but said, forget it, we're not going to testify, and if he don't want us in the way we've been trained, because the judge said, well, it might intimidate. <laughs> might intimidate people. Uh, I don't buy that. I think he's a liberal judge that thinks that firearms are the evil, are the only evil of society. And if we eliminate all firearms, we will eliminate evil. If we eliminate firearms and legalize all drugs, then we would reduce crime. That's what they think. It's what they think. Um, in England, I won't say all police officers, but a large portion of police officers in England do not carry sidearms. Okay? They do not carry weapons. I don't get that. What do you ask somebody? Can I, may I please put you under arrest, sir? Will you please place your head very, very gently? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm-mm. Okay, but it's our, it's what we live in. It's what, it's what we have turned into in this nation. We have taken weapons and made them the bad guy. And weapons are not the bad guy. They're not. It's the people who use them and decide how to use them. So a judge criminalizes and he basically said, if any of the police officers break this commandment that he set forth, he's going to put you in jail for contempt. He's going to lock you up. He's going to criminalize an officer fulfilling his duty. He's going to criminalize that. And of course, the cops stood up and said, we're not going to go in this guy's courtroom. Forget it. Okay, if, he doesn't want, if he doesn't want us in there, fine, we're not going in there. So I don't know how it's going to end up. Don't know what it's, it'll probably end up in a court situation, judges will decide whether or not this is even right or not. I don't know. But it's indicative of the nation we, we live in. In most, I wouldn't say all, but I would say in a large portion of urban public school systems, there is a constant push on children to hate guns, to be in fear of guns, don't touch guns, turn their parents in to local police. If they see a gun in their house, you call 911 and report that there's a gun in your house. And all of this is to try to take a generation of young people and teach and remove from them their ability to defend themselves and to fight a war. If you were to ask a lot of I don't know what they call this particular generation, Generation Snowflake or whatever, but if you were to ask that generation their personal opinion about guns, should we have more gun control, they, more than likely they will say yes, which doesn't speak well of the future of our nation because evil people are waiting, are waiting for the day in which America will willingly lay their weapons down and surrender. They're waiting for that day and it's coming because a generation of brave men who fought a war, who knows how to fight a war and who could still defend this country, that generation is getting older and moving off into the sun, riding off into the sunset. I mean, how, how old is Clint Eastwood? He's got to be 80-something, right? Okay? When he dies, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not making him some great Christian American hero, but he represents the ideology of America that says men should be like men and stand up and defend our nation and defend against the bad guys. Guys like that, they're not, we're not raising up a generation of children 
that would, let me back up. We had a man in our church, we called him Buster. And Buster Montgomery, when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, it made him mad. He was 17 years old. And without being drafted, he went and joined, he lied about his age and joined uh, the, I think it was the United States Navy. He ended up, they put him in Pearl Harbor and it ended up putting him on a submarine. But just the fact that Hawaii, which wasn't even a state then, was attacked by uh, Japanese, it made him angry and he willingly went and joined the military to fight for his country. Okay? And he wasn't alone. We had a lot of young men who willingly, they didn't wait to be drafted, they went and joined. And of course the army, they couldn't, some of these guys they couldn't accept. But they willingly joined anyway to do anything they could to serve. We had a whole nation full of people that did not join the military who were willing to go down to two meals a day. Who were willing to grow victory gardens. Who were buying war bonds. Who were collecting tin and scrap metal so it could be handed over so we could make weapons and tools and things like that that our military needed. We had the sacrifice of a nation in World War II behind fighting this fight. We don't, we don't have anything like that right now. If we, if we were to come out in a full out war in this nation, we would have a lot of people in this nation side with our enemies. Okay? That's what, that's what this is all about. In Judges 2 and 3, that's what this is all about. Because God knew that Joshua and his generation was a dying breed. And so he said, for the benefit of Israel. You have young men in this nation who do not know how to fight a war. Don't know what battle is. They don't understand that the land that they inherited from their fathers and their grandfathers was blood land. Their fathers spilled their blood to gain this land. They fought for it. They died for it. To them, that land was precious and they shouldn't just squander it away. And they shouldn't live their life in such a way that was scandalous or that was immoral in any way, knowing that God then would take that land away from them. That generation said, if we fought and died for this land, we don't want our children squandering away their inheritance. Does that make sense? I mean, a man works hard his entire life and saves up what he can. And when he dies, then his children, number one, they'll fight over that money. And number two, then they'll squander it away in just a matter of months. Would it took that man a lifetime to save? And it's not right. That is not right. And then it's not right for the government to tax it either. That income has already been taxed once. Anyway. But that's what, that's what this is all about. He said in verse 2 of chapter 3, only that the generations of children of Israel might know to teach them war. You have a hard time convincing even ministers nowadays that God is a God of war. They think God is a God of love and God loves everybody and God doesn't judge anybody and everybody's going to heaven. And uh, that's the sad condition. So now you have churches all over this county, all over the state of Missouri, everywhere that have taken the Bible, dulled it down, removed the sharp edges off of it by going to these new translations that are not the Word of God. This Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword. You know what that really means? The book of Proverbs says that the mouth of the strange woman is a sharp two-edged sword. What that means is, is that our Bible is able to defend against her and her spirit. Our Bible is better than her words. Our Bible will beat her. It'll win against her. 
So if you take that weapon away from people and don't teach them how to use it, they'll never be able to fight. They'll never be able to defend themselves. And if, you work, if you're the devil and you work it out just right, they won't want to defend themselves. You offer to take away from this generation game machines, expensive clothes, and their music that they listen to. You threaten to take that away from this generation, and you've bought yourself a war. They don't care about food. They don't care about earning. They don't care about working. They don't care about this. They don't care about that. They don't care about what's real in this nation. And now you have a generation of young people that says, maybe we do need to change the Constitution. Maybe we do need to do away with the Second Amendment. Well, then why don't we do away with their free speech, their right to burn a flag while we're at it? Why don't we just take away everybody's rights? Because that's what's going to happen. God knows it. God put it in the Word, and there's multiple lessons here to be learned. Is that number one, this nation, as bad as I hate to say it, we probably need a depression, and we probably need a war. Why? To save what it is that our forefathers died for. To save the Constitution, to save the freedoms that we enjoy here. Because freedoms are not for people who abuse them. They're not. On our faith side of this, your Bible is the weapon, but if you don't know how to use it, or if you're not inclined to want to use it, the devil then knows that you're going to be easy to destroy. Easy. We have a generation, in this, as in this country, we have a generation of people who don't want to fight. Now we have a generation of church people who think that getting along and having... Well, I heard something last night. I don't know. If, I want to chase a rabbit, but I better not. Do you know what every communist nation in history, you know how they got in power? They pushed the issue of social justice and workers' rights. Two things, social justice and workers' rights. That's how every communist power got into, got into power. It happened in Cuba, happened in Russia, happened in China, happened in North Korea, happened in every communist nation that took over and you had this evil dictator, they always pushed class warfare, race warfare, and social justice, okay? That's how they did it. They got people fighting one another. But anyway, back to the church. When the church doesn't, number one, know how to fight, number two, when church people don't have the inclination to fight, the devil will destroy them. So, can we foresee a day in the United States of America where people will willingly, willingly lay down and turn in all of their guns, pistols, shotguns, rifles, semi-automatics, Will we see a time when people will willingly lay down their weapons in this country? I believe we will. I think we're maybe a generation away from that time right now. And the reason why I say that is we already have in a large majority of the churches in this country people who have willingly laid down their Bibles, their swords. And they don't see even see the need of having a sharp two-edged sword to defend themselves with. Me, I know what my enemies are. Battling some of them this morning. I know what my enemies are. I know how they work on me. And I know what they try to get me to do. And that is 
go away. Just go away. Okay? I know what that, but I know what's at stake. I know that my future in heaven is at stake. I know that my family would be in danger. I know that this church would be in danger. I know that a lot of you people online consider me to be your pastor. I wouldn't want to just walk away from all that. But I have the enemies that want me to do that. So, is it worth fighting? Is it worth fighting? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Okay? So the, the, the battles that I fight, they're not always just about me. They're about what is most precious to me. That is my wife, my family, and my church. That's what's precious to me. Okay? And I have seen the enemies try everything that they could to get me out of the way. Okay? So that's what my thorns are all about. I've asked God to take them away. God says no. Now, does that mean I'm some wild, loose sinner that does everything that I want to do and my flesh is unruly? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that I know what I'm capable of and I know what the devil wants to do to me. And there's too much to lose to let him do it. Too much to lose to let him do it. So, you think about it this morning. Think about what you've got to lose. Now, some people, I probably won't say that. Some people might get to a place where they think they got nothing to lose. There's always something to lose. But if you've got family, if you've got your relationship with God, if you've got your faith, your faith is worth contending for. Um, Jude, let me read this very quickly. Read John Jude. Jude said in verse 3, I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Again, it's not about works. It's not about what we're doing or what we do. It's about what we believe and what we stand for. And it's, and it's worth, my faith is worth fighting for. And the source of that faith is worth fighting for. It's, it's worth it for, we need the Bible, Lisa and I need the Bible in our life. We need that faith to help hold our marriage together. We need that faith to pass that down to our children. We need that faith to pass that down to our grandchildren. We need that faith and the source of that faith to be able to hand it to the people who come here and the people who watch online. And then you, then you throw in the people of Kenya. That God has given it into our hands to feed them. God has given it in our hands to teach them, to train them, to help to take the faith that God has given us here and to preach it in places that we'll never see. In our lifetime, we'll never see these places, and yet God has given us that, and all of that is worth fighting for. Because if we don't fight, the devil will surely come, take it all away. Uh, turn to, yeah, turn to Proverbs 24. There is a great, great lesson here. Proverbs 24. 
while you're turning there, I'm going to read a couple verses. Proverbs 24, Proverbs 22, 5, thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. Now, if you look up on the screen, Deuteronomy defines froward. Because I had to look it up. Okay, I don't use the word froward a lot in my daily conversations. Deuteronomy 32, God says they are very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. To me, that defines what froward is and what a froward person is. Thorn, so Proverbs 22, 5, thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Look at those two extremes, two examples. A froward person is a person who is licentious. They, they care nothing about God. They care nothing about salvation. They care nothing about true religion. They care nothing about the Bible or a preacher telling them what to do. They care about nothing but their own pleasure, their own selves. That's what they care about. They are a froward person. And God says, Thorns and snares are constantly going to be in their life. The devil has them in traps. You ever been in one of those? You ever been in a trap that the devil laid for you and he snared you in something and he says, I've got you now and I can do whatever I want to with you. I can make you do, I can make you do what I want you. I can make you say or think whatever I want you. And you think about the people in our nation who are in traps to alcohol. They're in the snare of drugs and drug abuse, including in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, prescription drugs. They're in snares to whatever's on the Internet. And that doesn't always have to be pornography. It could be it could be gossip. It could be. Being part of some, I don't know, weird out of the way thing on the internet that they're part of and the devil has them in that trap. And he basically says, they'll do and say whatever I tell them to do and say. Because all you got to do with somebody who's an alcoholic or somebody who's a drug addict, all you have to do is threaten to take away or dry up their supply and they'll do anything. And they'll, what it, people will do anything for drugs. Am I right? They'll do anything. They'll steal. Steal from their own family. They'll kill. They'll rob. They'll beat up or they'll take getting beat up. They'll, they'll abuse and take abuse. All to get the drug. The devil has them in a trap and they will do whatever the devil tells them to do. So in the way of the froward, that, those who have no faith, there's always traps the devil puts them in to get them to do whatever he wants them to do. And because they're in that trap, they lose their desire to fight. At some point, they just give up and die. What a life. But he that doth keep his soul shall be far from them your soul is yours your soul is yours to do with as you please you can condemn your soul with the sins of your flesh or you can save your soul by the crucifying of your flesh but it's your soul to do with as you please but if you intend to keep your soul then the traps and the snares and the thorns that the devil has laid for people, God keeps you away from that. For the most part, God keeps you away from that. I mean, I will say that when you are saved, God removes a large portion of this world away from you. And you just don't want to run with them anymore. That's part of that new nature. Or that, that new creature that you are. He does remove, but to say that God takes away all of them, and if you go back to them, you're really not saved, that's not biblical, it's not what the Bible says. God leaves them in there. 
So, Proverbs 24, verse 30. Solomon said, I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. He's lazy and he has no understanding. He has no understanding because he doesn't have knowledge. You have, must have Bible knowledge in order to have God's way of understanding things. We call it a Christian worldview or whatever you want to refer to it as, but understanding in the Bible is Bible understanding. It's seeing, it's seeing the world the way God sees it and the way it really is. Uh, you have the humanistic worldview that says men are basically good. There's just a few bad eggs, and it's religion that's holding us all back. And if we got rid of a religion, then we would evolve to a greater species as humans we would be gods of our own universe and on and on and on and on. Okay? Those people are void of understanding. They do not believe in God. They do not believe the Bible. And so they don't see the world that way. It's that same crowd now who says that we can alter the DNA of any creature on this earth as long as what, whatever pleases mankind, that's what we can do, including our own genetic structure, including our own DNA. We can alter the, the DNA of corn, all the things we eat, cattle, pigs, sheep. We can alter all of that DNA. We can alter our own DNA because it's in our hand to do it. We don't believe in God. God didn't create it. So therefore, we can do whatever we want with it. And it's not true. So you have a, because you have a generation of people, number one, in this country, number two, who attend church who have no Bible knowledge whatsoever, they have no Bible understanding. They don't see the world the way God sees it. The way God sees it, God still says that uh, cohabitation outside of marriage is wrong. Okay, get amen. God says that's wrong. But the modern church, 21st century church, doesn't see it that way anymore. It doesn't want to see it that way anymore. Then we get into sodomy. According to the modern 21st century church, sodomy is not wrong anymore. So they quit fighting off the sins, these major sins. They quit fighting them off and they started embracing them as brethren. And what you've done is you've embraced your enemy. You've kissed your enemy and said, we can be friends. And the devil doesn't play fair like that. How many of you know that? Say amen. Okay. It's like, the liberals in this country wanting us to get along with every nation in the world. Uh, every nation in the world is not ever going to be our friend. So let's don't get along with them. Let's make ourselves strong so we don't have to worry about them. Am I right on that? I think I am. And it's the same principle spiritually. You cannot shake hands with the devil. You cannot dance with the devil. You cannot make friends or an agreement or an alliance with the devil. It doesn't work that way. So that man void of understanding, he's slothful. He doesn't see the world the way the Bible does. So he doesn't, he embraces all of his enemies. So verse 31, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles and thorns and nettles had covered the face thereof. Well, think about it. A garden, a flower bed. A, um, a bell, but any kind of field. What happens in a field in the state of Missouri when it lies fallow for 10 years? Cedars. Cedar, cedars will take over a field in a matter of a few years in America. Because all you got, if you ever walk through the woods and see a cedar thicket, there used to be a field there. Guarantee you, there used to be a field there. Okay? And a lot of times, you'll, if you'll look and you'll see cedars in a straight row, that was a fence line. Okay? That's where they grew. And a guy put a fence there, and he didn't allow it to grow inside of his field. He had cattle in there, or he had sheep in there, or whatever he had in there, or he raised crops in there, or whatever. But let that land go fallow, and you're going to have cedars and thorns and thistles and everything else growing in there. And those do not do us any good. So that's what happened. The bell rang, didn't it? But what happens, what is happening 
in churches, what is happening in this nation is that we are overgrown with thorns. Overgrown with them. That's because the people of that church and that pastor, number one, they were void of understanding. Number two, plain lazy. Just plain lazy. Lazy's not right. Amen? Father in heaven, give us understanding. Help us, dear God, to not be void of counsel. Help us to understand, see the world around us. See how things really are. Father, my heart goes out to everyone this morning who's struggling. And I pray, Lord, that you would help them. Lord, I am reminded today of my own thorns. And I hate them. I absolutely hate them. And Lord, I have no power against them. None. So, Father, I ask on behalf of all these people, Lord, that you either remove the thorn or you give them grace. Because without either one of them, we're not going to make it. We're just not going to make it. So, Father, remove the thorns in their life or give them grace and love them just the same. Thank you, Lord. Teach us some good things today. We need it. This country needs it. Our churches need it. Our family needs it. And help us, dear God, to stand always, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.